Hello, how are you doing? I'm Craig Parkinson. You are listening to the Two Shot Podcast. Sit yourself down, pop the kettle on. We're going to have a nice old chat. Who's it with this week? I'm going to tell you right now. <laughs> the devil are you it's thursday it's the podcast of course it's it's episode 90 can you believe it first off um i just want to apologize i'm back in manchester i drove up in the blistering heat yesterday which was kind of nice um and i'm in a new flat and as you can hear do you hear that it's annoying there's some construction going on because it's manchester and the forever building and also i can't work out how to turn this air conditioning off so apologies so i'll I'll be as brief as i can uh yeah i'm back in manchester recording this it is uh wednesday and what a response from last week's episode with julie hesman holsch um and here's the thing right sometimes you never know what people are going to be like you think you have an idea of what the person would be like and then you meet them and Julie was kind of everything. I was so chuffed. She was, she was so eloquent and, and passionate and fierce and, and nice, like, which is kind of a crap word, but she is one of the nicest human beings. And it, it is testament, right? Everybody, certainly on, on Twitter, who sent a message uh, between me and the podcast and Julie just to say how much they love the episode. Thank you so much. You know we appreciate that. She responded to each and every person by saying, like, thank you, I'm really pleased you liked. That's that's what she is. What a good person to do that. Um, and bloody hell, there was a lot of them. And she just kept doing them because it's all right. It's, it's kind of quite nice to, to say thanks, isn't it? So that was Julie, and I'm so pleased that you, that you enjoyed it. Um, what's next? Okay, look, I'll get on to today's episode in a sec. But if you are coming to see us live at Kendall Calling Festival, the great Kendall Calling Festival, we are doing two episodes, right? We're doing one at around 3 o'clock, gets Tim Peaks Diner, both at Tim Peaks Diner. And the first of our guests is past favourite the Reverend John McClaw and Laura McClaw, his wife. We're going to be talking all about marriage, having a relationship in a band, parenting, all sorts. It's going to be great. So I'm going to be sitting down with them before they're set on the main stage. I think they're on the main stage at 5.15. Make sure you get over and see them, but come and see us first, obviously. And then, and I haven't told anybody this, I'm not even sure if I'm allowed to say, at around six, Tim Peaks is going to be busting full of people. Why, Craig? Why? I'll tell you why. Now, I'm very, very excited to tell you that the legend himself, Mr. Niall Rogers, is coming on the podcast and uh, I've had to reformat it a bit because I've only got a limited time with Niall because he's been travelling. He's got to do a massive headline set on the Friday night with Sheik. Um, uh, but come along. It's going to be very, very interesting. There's a lots and lots of different people asking many, many questions. Um, yeah, I, I was just talking to somebody on the phone and uh, they went, you're really excited about this one. I said, I'm so excited. And I really am because obviously uh, I'm a massive fan of Niall. So to sit down um, for a good half an hour and, uh, and have an atta with him is going to be great. Um, right. Well, that's it. Sorry, I'm blathering on um, this week. So last year, uh, myself and Griff were at the Manchester Podcast Festival. I know there'll be people listening to this who were there and it was a great night with Ralph Little, wasn't it? And it, oh my God, we could have gone on for hours. Well, we did. Um, but afterwards, um, I think Griff went home. Um, myself and Ralph and a few of the the people who run the podcast uh, went and met up with other people because Richard Herring was doing his podcast on the same night with his guest was a comedian called Glenn Wool. And I met Glenn that night 
and we really got on. And I said, look, if you're ever up for it, I'd love you to come on the podcast. And he was really up for it. And we've made it happen just before he moves back to Canada for a while. So I'm really pleased that we managed to get it all together. So Glenn came to meet us on a, on a very warm day a few weeks ago in Soho. And instead of being in the spiritual home of Maison Bateau with all the artwork, as we normally are, it was, it was really gorgeous. So I said, well, look, why don't we go and record in Soho Square? So we did. Please enjoy this. It's brilliant. Uh, I'm a big fan of Glenn. He's the loveliest, loveliest guy, and I think you're going to enjoy it. So sit back, get on the treadmill, get on the commute, do whatever you're doing, and enjoy this is episode 90 of the Two Shot Podcast. Do you hear that construction? Bloody hell, fire. This is episode 90 of the Two Shot Podcast with the fantastic Mr. Glenn Wool. I'll see you at the end. Someone gave me some at work when I was in the makeup chair and I went, I could get used to this. I kind of quite like this oil business. Yeah. And I go put a comb through it every morning. Yeah. If it's, I, if it's there, I want it to be, I want it to, you know look and feel quite nice yeah yeah i find i i trim it that's 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 my major maintenance because if i don't it just goes it just goes the, the big one sticking crazy. straight out and, yeah do you look after yourself when you're touring no no <laughs> you've got to though have you ever have, have you ever had to cancel a gig yeah have you why Vo- vocal problems because you've been screaming and you just sort of lost it. Yeah, I mean, at the time I would have said, look, it was just wear and tear of work. But in retrospect, it wasn't. Because I, I can, I, I don't have vocal problems now, but I, I've, I've cut back a lot of the craziest parts of my life. So it was, it generally is, it's what you do after the show. If you just go home and have, um, have a quiet night afterwards then your voice will be fine but it's it's the well sometimes your adrenaline must be so high after the gig especially if it goes really well yeah yeah and you've got to sort of burn that off somewhat how yeah there's (laughs) there's healthy ways to do it and there's there is did you learn that the hard way then yeah well i got nodules now on my vocal cords and i yeah i went to the doctor in canada and the first thing he did he's like how much do you smoke and i was like oh like two cigarettes a day and then he stuck a camera down my nose and he's like you smoke way more than that i was like well i didn't know you're gonna stick a camera in my nose (laughs) (laughs) tell me about this but you know you get honesty out of me but tell me what you're gonna do next (laughs) well yeah he said um he said look we can burn those off uh but unless you change your change your ways they'll just grow right back so it was easier to change my ways. And did you start smoking? Yeah. 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 Quit smoking and, um, yeah, the, uh, the whiskey and all the things that come with it, too. I still, I still drink, although I'm taking July off. Um, and I have, I've kept to that, so I'm, I'm eight days in right now. So. And you feel okay about it? Yeah, but... Why July? Why are you taking July off? Because well, everybody else takes January off. No, it was uh, the Asian tour where I just drank. A, I drank a lot of beer, uh, so I was feeling really bloated. But I, yeah, I just I just drank a lot, um, and yeah, it, it it did it it didn't it wasn't hard. So that's why I don't really count. Like it's it's not been eight hard days because it, like, it's like it's like when you don't drink the, when you got a hangover. <laughs> <laughs> well, it must it took a lot out of you. <laughs> But also, you know, you're away on tour, on that Asian tour, you're away from the family. It's going to take its toll. Yeah. Uh, certainly emotionally as well. Well, that's the thing. I mean, drinking won't make your kid appear, but it will eat the time up between when, yeah. you, you know. And it makes it makes that time a little easier to pass. So It's not going to solve the problem, but it will sort of disguise it for, for yeah. a, a period of time yeah. anyway. Yeah, numbing the area, so to not, speak. Not that we're advocating uh, heavy drinking to for, to solve any problems. <laughs> hey, whatever works, man. <laughs> I, I, I neither advocate nor nor dissuade. It's uh, 
We just don't preach. No. Nah. Stop. Everybody has to find their own path, and that's okay. Yeah. So obviously, I want to talk about you. I want to talk about comedy. But first, I want to talk about love, and I want to talk about romance. All right. Man. I want to talk about how you and your wife met because I I heard about it and I thought it was a really <laughs> really great story. Do you know it's in it's in like um, it got picked up by a reporter and now it's in women's magazines. Is it? <laughs> Oh, I see. I knew it was a good story. (laughs) Yeah, like if you, uh, it's okay or hello or break time. (laughs) And it couldn't be more dismissive of who I am as a comedian. It's a local comedian, (laughs) Glenn (laughs) Watts. What? I mean, they had to, they had to give me. A, a little bit of do because the, the way it happened was um, uh, my uh, my now wife's best friend uh, tweeted to me on her on my wife's birthday saying it's my best friend's birthday can you say happy birthday to her she's your biggest fan right and I um, I initially declined <laughs> saying I don't I don't do stuff like that. And then I looked at her pictures. <laughs> I'm gonna reconsider. Yeah, she's she's a very, very, very attractive woman. Um and uh but I mean it was still playful in that, you know, I didn't wanna be one of those guys that just, you know, with some because it hadn't come in with um you know, it was just like, could you say happy birthday? You don't want to be like a creep all of a sudden. No. Oh, I can do more than that for you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, God. What are you chicks' numbers? You got? <laughs> <laughs> do you girls fly? Would you fly for fun? <laughs> and I mean, we both know that in our industry, there's <laughs> there's certain people that oh, would go in like that. God. I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> would have crawled through the internet to get to them. <laughs> you just would have seen a hand coming out of your smartphone. <laughs> <laughs> so I I um I said um uh, I I did I did wish her happy birthday in the end and then Amber um uh, who was the friend uh said uh, of my wife Alex she she said uh, would you consider marrying her for her birthday uh, she's she's really nice <laughs> and uh and I I said something to the effect of I I wouldn't, I, I, you know, I, she she seems, I, I wouldn't put her through that. <laughs> I, would, I wouldn't put anybody through that. Why would I inflict that? Yeah, yeah. Come on. He said she was nice. And then um, Alex tweeted on top of that, um, don't tell him I'm nice. Tell him I'm dirty. <laughs> <laughs> so... Um, and she would have been, uh, she would have been 27 at the time, and I would have been 40. Um, she, uh, I decided to make a little joke. I said, "Well, just what every dirty girl wants on her birthday: a dick pic." And I sent, I, I tweeted a picture of um, Richard Burton, <laughs> like in full uh, Mark Antony regalia, like yeah. the purple robe and the leafy thing, and. And they all, they both were like, LOL, ha, 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 ha. And only like a year ago, I found out they had no clue who Richard Burton was. <laughs> no, they didn't really. <laughs> and she said, she, they both talked about it quietly, like DM saying that they just assumed it was a picture of a dick. Like, <laughs> a guy just. Somebody called Dick. Well, no, like, like just, just a, like a guy who was a dick. Oh, was a dick. Right? And I was like, you know, it's true, though. <laughs> like, Richard Burton was a dick. <laughs> I, don't, I don't even think his mates would come in like, oh, what are you talking about? I'm not defending yeah. him. <laughs> but, um, but even like, even with that, like, that's that's where it ended. Like, so I, was on my, I was on my couch in Canada when that happened, and uh, Amber was teaching English in Thailand, and Alex lived uh, here in uh, the U.K., and that was just, you know, every once in a while I'd tweet something and both of them would like it. And, you know, just... You know, just um, As is the uh, way on yeah, social media. Yeah, yeah. A, friend, a friendly um, 
every once in a while a friendly chat would ensue and uh, then uh, I was over up for Frankie Boyle uh, at just the Soho Theatre just a block away from here and um, I, I just yeah I wasn't living here at the time I was just in town doing some gigs and she tweeted um, right after because a friend of hers who I'm not sure I think had sort of taken her there on a date and gotten her tickets to see the show oh, and she really? was like oh, I got to see my favorite comedian Frankie Boyle and then my second favorite comedian Glenn Wool was opening for him and I was uh, at that point I, I said well uh, I'm in town do you want to get a drink because we'd had we'd, we'd talked but it was one of those is this a date isn't this a date right, you yeah. know but um was that yeah. privately you messaged her? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Um, but the other stuff was like right out in the open, yeah. out loud. But yeah, that pri- I privately said. And then, um, yeah, we went out for a drink and it was just obvious we fancied each other. And then at that point, I, um, I gave her a nice kiss. And we, <laughs> we, went, we went on many dates afterwards and then we got married and now we've got a kid. But... Uh, it, it's it's one of those bitter sweet uh, stories in that uh, we started dating and then I was on an uh, Asian tour and I told Alex that she should come with me you know sort of the next step in the relationship and we'd always get a chance to meet Amber yeah. um, who had gotten us together who was over in Thailand in Thailand yeah. and uh, Alex flew out and um, was uh was able to uh, get there, but uh, Amber got bitten by a mosquito, uh, developed uh, dengue fever, and died. Oh, Just man. like like more out of the blue than than you can imagine. But it was just and uh, and and I never actually ever got a chance to meet, to meet her meet but her. Alex was able to be by her side um, just to say goodbye one more time and she never she never recovered from the coma that she was in but she she uh, Alex said she was a pair that she uh, she was aware that the that the, she was there and sort of wiggled her finger a bit and stuff yeah. and the doctor said that that was that was an amazing sign but never never recovered and they had wow. to turn the machines off so it's so fucking sad I mean as you say it is bittersweet yeah but how beautiful that she sort of started to orchestrate that and now you're where you're at now. I mean, I know you lost what you all lost. But. Yeah. It's, it's, I mean, it's, um, it's Alex and I can see she still misses her. It's like oh, Amber God, was bet. her best friend. Was, from was when, her best friend. Yeah, from yeah. when she was three years old. Oh, shit. So, um, it was, it was strange too, uh, when I, because I kept saying, because I'd, I'd had loads of friends who've had dengue fever and, and although it's, it's terrible, um, I didn't even think he could die from it, but there's a certain strain that um, that kills you, or, or that you know has like a 25 percent survival rate uh, ratio. Um, but when it finally became, because I kept I kept telling Alex, like I I I made sure she was able to go back there. I got her on a plane and uh, and everything. Um, but I kept saying it's going to be fine. She's going to come out. But when I realized she wasn't, I sent, I sent a DM to uh, to Amber. Of course, she was in a coma, and just saying that, you know, thank you for everything, and I'll, I'll, I guess I'll have to take care of her now. And 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 yeah. um, I wish we could have met. And like I knew it was never going to be red, but I, I found it quite cathartic. And then um, it turned out her her boyfriend did did read it and and told Alex about it and. Um, it's weird though it's like um, you know it's sort of it's, it's one of those things in the in the information age you never had a chance to do something like that before but I, I did I did actually do that to another friend that um, had struggled with health issues for years and then he he slipped into a coma in Hawaii and we were all told when they were going to turn the machines off and I, right. I sent him a text right at the time the machine would have been going off just well, you're right there is something very cathartic about that mm-hmm. even though you, if you know it's like writing a letter to somebody that you know they're never going to read but you, you know you're doing it for the different reasons yeah yeah I would su- I would suggest it to anybody if um, if you have the opportunity to 
to do something like that. It, well, it I does was, help. I was talking to a, a comedian and she was going through a very difficult time of her life. And uh, she, it was suggested to her that she, she just goes away, just goes away, just leave the children, go away for a week and just go and write. Not necessarily to write a show, just to write, just to get it out of your system so you can see these words in front of you and you can realise how you feel and what's going on. And anyway, it grew and grew and then it turned into a show. But it's, that wasn't her intention at all. It was purely for therapeutic reasons and cathartic reasons to get it all out so she could see mm. sometimes if you write down you can see what's going on yeah i had i went to a therapist once and he made he kept making me do that and um in the end i stopped seeing him just because that's what i do all day <laughs> i was just like i don't need you for this no. <laughs> you know like i was i would be in a like i'd get there a half hour early, I'd sit in a cafe and I'd just start writing, and then I'd go in. And he's like, "Well, you got to write all this down." I'm like, "I don't. We got. We got to come up with something that I'm not doing anyway." Yeah. Do you think it is a uh, stand-up is a form of therapy for everybody, for all comedians? It depends what you're doing with it, but yeah, I definitely think um, it may may not be a. It may not be cathartic, but it would definitely be a way to diagnose something yeah. in, in somebody. <laughs> like, if they truly had written all the material, you could say, yeah, okay. And it's starting to, it's starting to come to light now, too, uh, just how much mental illness there is in stand-up comedy. Why do you think? Because people are being more honest with how they are. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, and I think... I think it's it's been um, it's being looked at more by um, uh, uh, it's being studied more, so it's it's getting diagnosed. I I talked to a stand up in um, Liverpool this weekend, uh, Paul Smith. I don't know if you know him at I know all. No, of Paul Smith. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he's he's going stratospheric yeah. right now, and just in such an amazing way too. Um, you know, no real backing from television or anything. Just you know, just all all the internet. And he's a great comic. You know, he doesn't he doesn't get enough credit. But anyway, um, he told me that he talked to somebody uh, uh, that said they reckon from the amount of um, uh, adrenaline that we go through, like adrenaline spikes just yeah. from gigging, that we've got a form of PTSD. Um, just in that, uh, that the, the, um, it's not adrenaline that causes PTSD. It's, it's the thing that lingers in your system afterwards right. from the, from the adrenaline. And if yeah. you don't, if you don't get that out the right way, it can, uh, linger. Yeah. So, um, I should have listened to the whole sentence. <laughs> <laughs> I was just shaking in the corner. <laughs> Do you know we were talking just before we started? Oh, I gotta about... shift a bit. My legs gone. Get, get comfy. Yeah, there we go. Do you know we you were saying? Look at each other. We can... You were saying that you're now you're more sort of well known here than you are in Canada. Yeah. And now, you know, soon, very soon, you're going to go back to Canada. Do you feel in any way you've got to crank it up and almost reinvent yourself or start again, or you've got more to prove? Uh, no, I, I won't. I won't change too much because the 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 credits I have um, transfer like the 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 gigs that I'm playing. They know who I am and, yeah. and what I can do. So if I did if I did change it to uh, to try and suit what I think they wanted, then they could go. Well, that's not who we are, <laughs> you know. And also in that respect, you wouldn't even be true to yourself and true to what you do, would you? If you're trying to please other people. Yeah, it's a it's a real easy way to screw things up when you start to. It's funny that it that that's the it's a trap a lot of comics can fall into before a really big gig. They can convince themselves, oh, I gotta. I got to change it all. You know, I got it this far, but yeah. Because then, that's then, what the audience want. Well, you just you just get stuck, trapped in your, you know, self-destruct almost. <laughs> you, you think you're right at the time, but yeah, you you could, a, com a comic could easily fall into that trap. Have of, you ever fallen down that or, uh, or been tempted? Yeah, yeah, I think sometimes I've not performed my best on my biggest gigs just, 
you know. A lot of the time, too, it can, um, it can be what they do to you before big gigs, too. They sequester you in an area and keep you there. And, you know, you, you don't really get to talk to anybody. And, you know, they're... They'll put makeup on you three hours before you're supposed to go on. And then it's like, okay, sit down, don't touch your face, and don't talk to anybody that you know. I know, I'm not restricted. I'm absolutely free. I'm fine. <laughs> yeah, yeah. we've got a microphone on you now, too, so <laughs> watch what you say. Yeah. Do you still, do you get nervous before gigs? I, no, I mean... Or is nervous the wrong word? Yeah, I think uh, sometimes I get... Um, I want the I want the gig to be started, you know, like just um, you might have mistimed your, your your preparation and like a half hour before you're just like oh we we'll just start the goddamn gig, you know? yeah. Um, but I don't think I don't think I get nervous. I did have a had a weird thing for a while. Um, it, it it was. Uh, you know, it was nobody, no doctors, nobody could tell me what it was. Uh, I had this really strange urgency to pee before the show. It felt like I needed a massive piss. Yeah. But I didn't. Like, I'd go and have a pee, uh, and then it would still feel like I needed this great big pee. Right. And it would be, it would go on through the whole show. It felt like I was about to constantly piss my pants, which is not... It's not not conducive for a stand-up <laughs> well, or during, a, ju- think during of, a show. Yeah, but I don't think anybody wants to feel no, like... But especially in front of all those people, and yeah, all you want to do is get your set Unless out you're a German porn star. <laughs> <laughs> and that's very niche bracket. It's yeah, not, yeah. It's not everybody who can do that. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't even say you're a star at that point. You're just... A you're burden. working in the industry, but you're not a star. <laughs> uh... And yeah, I kept going to doctors and um, going, you know, and they, the, the best, some of them would prescribe me out of van or stuff like that. But it, with anything like that, you either have to take it in a high dose and be whacked out, out of your skull when you get on there, um, or you take it in such a low dose, it doesn't do anything. So there's uh, no middle ground. Nah, and I was always, I'd, I'd never... Yeah, like I, I, I don't know. I don't know what it was, in the end. But it ne- like, you could, you couldn't, you couldn't trick it like that. <laughs> and did it, was, it just, did it just eventually go? Yeah, but I still get like. I mean, I'm not a hundred percent comfortable talking about it right now because I can feel the edge of it going. Well, I could come back at any time. Let's change subject. No, 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 no. No, I'll fight it. Especially because uh, you got a gig tonight. Come on, I don't uh, want to be doing that. It's a little gig. I'll piss my pants at this. It's alternative <laughs> comedy. I'd probably, <laughs> probably, I'd probably win an award. <laughs> <laughs> but can he do it every night? <laughs> if I have a cup of coffee, I can <laughs> So, can we talk about growing up in Canada? Sure. How was that? I loved it. I loved it. Um, it was... Uh, what about where you were in? Was it in Vancouver? No, no. We were in... Um, I was born in Mississauga, which is a suburb of Toronto. Mm. Two years there, five years in the Yukon, um, up by Alaska, and then five years in Saskatchewan, which is the flat bit in the middle it looks like a football pitch yeah uh and then uh the rest of the time of vancouver so what was the reason for the moves uh my dad was a mountie was he he was he was he used to come to jolly old london he was the one who caught jeffrey archer yeah wow yeah (laughs) Jeffrey Archer, who is still a friend of my dad's and doesn't look at him like he does. He's not mad at him at all. He's no. just like, oh, jolly old chap, you got me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but he, I mean, he went on to have a good life away from politics. So maybe he was happy to be out of it. But yeah, Jeffrey Archer had, um, he had uh, uh, investments with a company uh, called Aquablast. Right. Um, that was designed for cleaning buildings, which was a much bigger deal when uh, London and Glasgow were coal-powered. Um, all the buildings were really black, 
So it was a way to um, clean them off. Uh, and he told the government, you need to do this. And they bought, they bought all the equipment. <laughs> and my dad was like, you know he owns that company. Because <laughs> it was a Canadian company. That's what Quirk, my dad's interest. He was a, he was a bad stock investigator. So, um, yeah, he was, he was coming over here a lot when I was a little kid. But were you coming over with him at the time? Nah, no, no. Nah. Caused a lot of um, friction between my mom and dad because she was there. And it's only, it's only when you become a parent yourself. She was in Canada in the suburbs of Toronto with three boys under the age of five. Right. And he was, uh, you know, he was running around Europe in a leather jacket. Catch, he, he was investigating Meyer Lansky. And, wow. Yeah. He's got some really good stories about Europe. Do you know what, do you know what the closest thing, the, the time I, the, uh, when my parents watched Bridge of Spies. Right. Um, the uh, the relationship between um, the American and his wife, my my mom and dad, kept looking over at each other. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You see? Yeah. Well, the fact my dad watched a movie means it it was a good movie because he will generally watch about a half an hour and then and then switch off. Well, he'll scuttle into his office and then just start making phone calls. Like he's a lawyer now. Is like, he? Yeah, yeah. Well, he got fucked over by the police in Canada. They he charged somebody that they were they all had investments with. <laughs> they were like, no, 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 he's, he's fine, George. What are you talking about? And he got him found guilty, but um, yeah, they wanted to um, they wanted to make him go <laughs> go be the RCMP officer in the American embassy, yeah, in Baltimore. So we almost the well, I was almost American when I was little, yeah. But it was you know such a ceremonial bullshit position so he just resigned and went to law school and that's what because that was in the Yukon and then he went to law school in Saskatchewan right. and then became a lawyer and um, why did he sort of go back to education 45 because he oh had oh my god yeah he, he retired like he had enough time in the force that he got his pension and he went to university on his pension so that's wow. how poor we were when I was a little kid um like it, it was weird because we were we started off we were sort of um, in Canada you call it middle class which is just you know your dad's a cop he earns a good living yeah and then we were super poor because my like we were living on a cop's pension and also paying for university for my dad yeah so we were just ridiculously poor like like we're never hungry or anything but still but you know like if we broke a hockey stick we knew like like that was a big issue um and then he became a lawyer and then we were quite wealthy so we had i had i can i can see things from everybody's perspective of course Uh, and of course you know you won't be where you are now you have to go through all that yeah yeah no i but you know you know what i've always said uh we were happiest as a family when we didn't have any money. Really? Isn't yeah, that interesting. Because yeah. I was mm-hmm. going to say, did that put a strain on on the family dynamic with your dad doing what he was doing and uh, things? You know, you know, you were you were eating, but it, it, things were poor. So sometimes that can put a restraint. But you're saying that was yeah, when you were happiest. No, the the money the money bought freedom, and then um, freedom drove us all apart. Like uh, uh, we. You know, if you're broke, you, you just sort of have to play together. And yeah. there's, you know, there's one toy. There's not three. <laughs> <laughs> you learn. Yeah, of yeah, course. Yeah, and, you know, like uh, there's money for baseball gloves and an old tennis ball and stuff, but not much more. So, you know, you find the other kids in the playground and you all end up playing baseball or, or street hockey or just because that's the that's the cheapest game going. Like I yeah, mean, I mean, that's all we've got right now. Yeah, so make do with what we've got. But also more fun and more. Um, you know, you learn how to you learn how to get along and and um, and and be friends with the with a large group of people. And also, you never, I you know, there's there's nothing more fun than like a big group of kids just 
sort of rascling around. No, and it's good. <laughs> That's know? start of life skills, isn't it? That's fantastic. Uh, and Saskatchewan was great for it too because it's just, I mean, it's just a really safe place and there's a river that goes through the middle of town. Uh, so we could, we could fish in the river, never catch a goddamn thing, but we could fish in the river. Uh, the university was quite open and, and it was a really easy un- or university to get into. So it always had interesting people yeah. going to it. And like we, they, like they just they'd put, they'd flat out put on exhibits for kids, and you could just go to the university. And that's where I learned about uh, Da Vinci and all the uh, other Renaissance. So just as a kid, they explained it. And I, I I got a job. I used to deliver newspapers to the um, to the dorms, of yeah. the university. But it was all like families and stuff. So these were uh, people from all over the world. Um, they they were going to this. University of Saskatchewan, and uh, yeah, it just really gave me a. Uh, I, 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 it was a very multicultural experience, and the school we went to had kids from all over the world. It was a wonderful, wonderful way to grow up. When you, you touched on before about you saying, you know, you know, in certain ways, money kind of drove you all apart. Were you, were you being flippant there, or was, did it drive you apart? Uh, yeah, no, we were never as close as we were in Saskatchewan. Um, but, I mean, we came out, we went, we moved out to Vancouver to be closer to both my parents' parents. They both lived on the coast, which is quite a Canadian thing to do because mm. it's, it's a temperate it's still climate. Together. My parents, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah they, were, they were just out here. <laughs> uh, were they? Yeah. You come and see the grandson? Uh, for the wedding. Oh, of course, for the yeah. wedding. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think, um, I mean, we were getting to that age too, cause we would have been, uh, getting off into being closer to teens too. So it probably yeah. would have happened anyway in Saskatchewan, but because you can draw such a definitive line, yeah, you can, you just remember being closer to your brothers. But I, I, I really do think it played a part, you know, cause we all had, uh, yeah, once we all had our own cars and stuff, we were just, you know, you're yeah. away. Yeah. And how yeah. was school life for you, Glenn? I was never a talented student. <laughs> I was quite did you get, a did you get on student. with it, though, or did you just end, was it oof, redundant for you? Or? Yeah, I don't think I was listening very much. I wish I had. Uh, there's things I, like, I was in French class from the age of five all the way to 16. And now I can understand you if you talk really slowly <laughs> and, and uh, yeah I, I didn't even think that but if 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 I were to go to France for a month I would I would probably get back into it yeah but I definitely if I'd done more than draw penises on the textbooks mm. which I it it seemed almost like that's what they were trying to get you to do with those textbooks <laughs> like, <laughs> for the amount of like just like guy like a guy ha- standing with two hands on his hips <laughs> you know, what arching do you his back me to do yeah. <laughs> <laughs> learn french <laughs> you think that's what's going to happen <laughs> yeah uh, and was there a plan was it just to like just let's get this school thing out of the way and i can get out doing what i want to do yeah i i from the age of 12, I knew I wanted to be a stand-up comedian. Did you? Yeah. Where did that come from? Well, and it used to be the most innocent story I had. This is when we were living in Saskatchewan. Yeah. Very, very little money to go around. But as a family, our favorite comedian was coming to town. And it was a really odd thing for him to do because he was uh, he's, he's American Big, big comedian, but apparently there's different stories about why he used to come to Saskatoon all the time. One was that in the uh, in the 70s and in the 60s, he used to come up there and he really liked it because uh, uh, he, they wouldn't treat him any differently. And right. he said it was like small town America, but with no bigotry or hatred. And, and he really, really enjoyed that. Um, Others say it was a woman. Uh, we don't. We don't know. But uh, I got to see this world-class stand-up comedian, uh, and I just remember going, "Okay, that's what I'm going to do." 
And for years it was, ah, oh, that's wonderful. Bill Cosby. <laughs> <laughs> I, forget, I just, I was open and praying that you're going to come out with what, somebody like that. It was on my list then. <laughs> yeah, thankfully, there's there's now an ever-growing list of comedians. <laughs> it's non-stop. <laughs> Did you tell people at that age, oh, yeah, if someone said, oh, Glenn, so what are you going to do when you're older? Oh, I'm going to do this. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I was always quite open about my uh, my motives. Oh, and were, were people supportive if they went, well, you can't do that? I, yeah, I don't I don't know. Like, it's just, people just, just think, well, yeah, you're weird, so, <laughs> yeah, it makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> but I also, um, it, wasn't, it wasn't just about telling people, it was about um, recognizing what you needed to do to do that. And the one thing I realized very young is that um, a lot of people used to make people laugh with impressions and catchphrases. Mm, yeah, yeah. And I said to myself, don't do that because it's not, it's not, it's not legitimately funny. It's like it, you're reminding people of something. You're not, you're not making something out of your own brain. Yeah, it's a trick. Really. Yeah. So I would purposely, and I, I, yeah, I mean, maybe it's because I'm not very good at impressions or accents. <laughs> so maybe it was a, it was a way of going. Well, you don't need them anyway. But, uh, but in retrospect, the the reasoning was correct, and uh, and I was glad I was able to um, to see it. I, I mean, a lot of people have regrets about um, when they're younger and go, "If I could go back, I would tell my younger self this and that." But I. I do look back at some of the things my younger self did, and I was like, yeah, totally. I was totally right. <laughs> well, I won. Uh, the, whole way, the whole way I got to go to Europe was I won $10,000 on a scratch ticket when I was 19 years old. Um, or no, I was 18. I hadn't started comedy yet. I put it in the bank thinking, oh, I'll need that at some point. Did you? Yeah. I did, That's yeah. That's a really mature thing to do at that age. I think I took like a thousand and, you know, spent it on what, what have you. But, uh, but what a smart thing to do. Take a little bit for yourself, put the rest in. Yeah, yeah. And then uh, I ended up getting in a car accident. Once I'd started stand-up and I'd been going for a few years, rode off my car, got a whiplash settlement, and instead of buying another car to do um, uh, more gigs in Western Canada, which wouldn't have, well, you know, it would have just set me on a path for a colloquial uh, existence. Yeah. Uh, I decided, no, and, and most, most comics at the time, I think this would have been about 20 years ago, they were all focused on getting to the States because that was seen as like, oh, you get down there, anything can happen. Nothing, nothing, nothing big can happen to you in Canada. Nothing bad can happen to you in Canada. You got to get to the States. And I thought, you know what, I think it's Europe. So I consolidated all that money that I got, and I went backpacking. And within, I came over, and within two weeks, I'd found a club in... Um, uh, Denmark that I, I managed to pop on stage and then that led to this, this, this and I had some friends in Edinburgh and I popped up there and it all it all went from there but it just it took the foresight of going oh Europe's the way forward and now I think it's more more comics are trying to get to Europe as this you know they're, they're you can it's, it's always obvious they always want to get to the States but you know they, they come over with the best intentions, like, oh, no, this is where I'm going. But the first sniff of uh, first sniff of a chance in the States, they took it. And I did it, too. I, I went to the States, so I can't. How was it when you went to the States? It's not for me. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. No, I, 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 I wouldn't, I, like, I would go back there if, if there was something to do. But um, it's, I don't know. It's sort of like, like, would you want to live in a mu in an amusement park? <laughs> well, no, if I was talking to somebody about this last week, yeah, no, it's a nice place to visit. Yeah, but I, it's just not for me. And I, I when I was there, and I, I, I'm not I'm not a guru. I didn't predict it totally. I didn't predict Trump, but I said there's something coming, and it's not going to be good. <laughs> like you could see you could see the under boilings of oh uh, there. <laughs> you know, like a doctor flicking an x-ray going yes you're right here this is I don't know what not this supposed is. to be uh, that color 
<laughs> yeah, cut it off. <laughs> Blast it. <laughs> yeah. do you, do you, can you remember the first time when you went on stage? Yeah, because you've been tinkering around writing. And what, what, what was the point where you went, no, this is ready to, to show people now? Well, I, uh, I, got, um, I got dumped by my high school sweetheart right. uh, the day after my grandpa's funeral. <laughs> Oh, we've got to get some good material from that, surely. Come on. Do you know what? I don't think I ever did get the material from it. But what I did get from it was uh, just the f- just the full understanding or the full belief. Oh, my life is my life is terrible. I'm unlovable. Uh, the time marches on. The, you know, my, my family's dying. I'm depressed. I'm going to get all of my depression out right now. I'm going to go and prove to myself I can't do this thing I've always wanted to do also. So in a sort of a pragmatic way of going, well, I don't think I could feel any worse than I do right now. So uh, I couldn't even do that right. (laughs) (laughs) And how are you when things aren't going well during a gig? How when Because... Did you hit the ground running? Yeah, I had a really good first gig. Yeah, 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 yeah. But I'd been, like I said, I'd been writing uh, a long time and uh, keeping keeping things in a notebook. And that's what I, you know, if anybody asks me about stand up and any tricks, and I'm just like, oh, there is no tricks. <laughs> you just you get a moleskin and a favorite kind of pen, and if you ever get found uh, out in the streets without it, then you're not really trying, you know? You, oh, you just any idea you get, you, you stop and you write it down and you surround yourself and people, you surround yourself with people who don't ask you what you're doing when you're doing that. <laughs> it's just, it's such a, like, what do you think I'm doing? <laughs> Writing you a ticket? Like, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> um, yeah, and I, so so I had I I sort of um, I I'd, I'd been doing that for a few years. So the the first gig I was quite ready for, but I mean it didn't I didn't just kill the rest of the time. I uh, you know I had I had good shows, I had bad shows, but I was 19 at the time. I had a car. I didn't have another job, and mm. I was willing to go anywhere to do stand up comedy. And the kind of gigs, like once you got a car, like there's there's gigs available all the way through the interior of British Columbia. They're just you can get there, you can do it. Yeah. Nobody else wants to, because they used to have this thing called the cabaret license in British Columbia. Meant that your bar could stay open for an hour later every night, but you had to have entertainment once a month. Yeah, and the cheapest form of entertainment was stand-up comedy. So the people in the bars hated it, uh, but they could drink longer because of it. So they actually had to mask the stage, not tell people when it was on, and then just at eight o'clock on Tuesday, the bar manager would run on stage and go, "Here comes Glenwell." <laughs> <laughs> and they would be like people go oh fuck <laughs> god damn it. like they'd unfurl a backdrop a light would come on and like, it wasn't just me i was the opener so i had to go up and do a half hour and then uh you know some local legend would come on and do an hour and um yeah it was a great way a great way to like just learn how to get everyone's attention right off the bat and 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 uh, also power through and, you know, like, he couldn't really get fired, you know, because <laughs> they didn't have anybody to, anybody else who wanted to do it. So, yeah, it was, uh, I, mean, I remember one time there was this group of loggers that had come in, like, they'd been in the woods for two months or something like that, and they'd tried to find the quietest back part of the bar that they could like they're like submariners trying to reacclimatize themselves <laughs> to the shore <laughs> and the light came on they were all like ah! <laughs> I'm trying to work the crowd like, so what do you do oh I'm a logger <laughs> <laughs> that had transpired <laughs> I was like, I think back there, and a lot of like the just the brashness of of youth. I was just dumb. I was lucky. I was wasn't just 
disappeared into the woods. <laughs> but did you think you were kind of unafraid at that point? No, we all wouldn't have been scared of anything. I'd have been, you know, like, you know, calling out their shirt and I fucked your mom and, you know, I wouldn't have been afraid of anything. You know, you're just dumb. You're dumb when you're young. And, um, I mean, you've got enough. I, I, I think at those points, too, uh, there's enough witnesses that the guy couldn't really do anything. Like, I mean, there's one, there's one comic in uh, Canada, um, and he always used to, um, he always used to act like one guy in the front row wasn't getting the show, and it was always the guy to the left, yeah. like to the left of center, and he'd just keep going. Oh, he doesn't get it. He, 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 he. And it was always, it was never based on who it was. It was just based on where he was comfortable pointing. Well, you're playing a game of pretty nasty roulette there. <laughs> and he got, guy just out of prison. <laughs> first, first thing he'd done to karate, like, I'll take the wife out on a date. <laughs> I haven't seen her for seven years. <laughs> God. And he, he laid such a beating on the comedian. <laughs> the crowd was just stunned into this silence. The guy had to go back to prison. <laughs> oh, no, he didn't. <laughs> oh. Yeah. Oh, that is uh, fucking tragic. Yeah. Has, you know, over the years, has the way you write, has that changed or has that grown in any way? I think, yeah, you improve. It's like anything. You you learn uh, you learn how to streamline it. And, um, yeah, the, the biggest, biggest problem, I think, with um, when you're learning how to tell a story... Is you tell everything, and you realize our jokes are jokes are good for that. Where you start to be able to clip the extraneous information, and uh, you know, there's one there's one core. The 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 trick is to try to give the use the least amount of words to get to the biggest amount of laughs. Yeah. So uh, throw it all there, and then start editing. Yeah. 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 Yeah, and then you learn you learn how to do that with time. Some comics don't, but they can make they can make that journey fun in their own way. So it's it's different for it's different for everyone. But I I would say that would be the one of the things I've learned in time is. Has there ever been a time when you haven't been enjoying what you do, remembering this is something that you've said you're going to do when you're twelve years old? Yeah, yeah. It well, I mean. I mean, I know, look, we all have good days and bad days and sometimes we don't enjoy what we do, but saying that and actually really meaning it are two very different things. Yeah, I mean, you could you could say that once, but then, um, you know, they're also... Uh, how many times have you feared not doing it again? You right, know? exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's the flip side, isn't it? Yeah, and I would say the, the amount of times that I thought, oh... God, I, I never get to do it again. Um, is you know, there, I, I would be more scared of that thought. Like, like when I was telling you about that piss thing, the doctor, one of the doctors I went to, just very flippantly went, "Well, you probably just need to get a new job." <laughs> <laughs> First of all, my job is harder than being a doctor. I'm, I, I know that because I know doctors who can't do my job. I've seen that happen before. Uh, and uh, you know we can all Google symptoms. <laughs> Act like you're some big fucking Doogie Hauser. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it's, it's just so it's just so like well, just you know, just find another thing. It's, it's so hard to get good at this, you know. And that's when I also hear people complaining about. Um, you know, the subject matter of a comedian's mm. act going, well, I don't see why you have to tell a joke about this. You can't control what you write about. If I wrote, if I wrote a perfect joke about any subject, yeah. 
I would not be able to not tell you. Like, even if I go, oh, well, somebody, you know, that could trigger somebody into thinking about it. I Look, my job is to write jokes, uh, you know. <laughs> I might, I might, in my old age, I'd be able to mask it better, you know, act like somebody else said it. <laughs> Put on a wig and a fucking general's hat and, oh, well, <laughs> Captain... Captain Hardy says this, you know. <laughs> there's always ways around it, yeah. but if you write a perfect joke, I think it's uh, it's it's up to you to tell it, regardless of uh, yeah. Do you think anything's off limits? No, no, because it's not for me. Like you could tell me a joke about anything, um, but it would be whether or not I laughed at it. Like yeah. um, that, you know, not everything's funny. That's true. But, um, what's funny to one person isn't funny to another person. So I, th- I think the um, the onus is on um, is on um, the uh, audience member to do a little research and uh, and to see what they like. And uh, you know, you could find yourself in a pl- in a place where you didn't enjoy what was going on. But I don't think that that would give you the right to tell everyone to stop. No, and also you can just remove yourself from that situation. Well, that's what if I would not, do. If, like, if I'm in a... I was at the... I was I had a day off work the other day, and I thought, well, I'm going to go to the cinema. I haven't been to the cinema for a long time, and very rarely do I get to do that yeah. of an afternoon. And I sat there and I started watching this film and I was like 45 minutes in and I'm going, I'm just not enjoying this. So I'm just going to, I'm going to go, I'm going to leave. Yeah. And I don't, I've got no qualms with doing that. If you, it's a waste of time. It's yeah. a waste of people's time. Yeah. Just remove yourself from the situation. You don't have to sort of piss and moan about why this is wrong or why you think this is wrong. Well, I mean, uh, attention is now currency too. Um, for, also, for for good and for bad, and also nowadays everybody's a critic. Yeah, it's so easy. <laughs> I know, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. There you go. Another one's popped up. <laughs> yeah, like that. yeah. The one like, why would you want to be known as a critic? <laughs> 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 you have the power of the internet at your disposal. You can do anything. You can be anything. You are a cyber god. I've got a few points I'd like to make about this day of entertainment. Or so-called entertainment. Wow. <laughs> he could have been learning about frogs or some, some. He could have been learning about something. I didn't like it, and here's why. <laughs> Glenn, I've loved talking to you. This has been brilliant, man. Yeah. I wish you all the best in August when you go back to Canada. Thank and, you. And um, anytime you're over here, please come and see me. Oh, I'll come and see you do some stand-up. I'd love that. Yeah. Okay, cool, take man. care. Thanks, man. Thank you, too. I'll, I'll join you in these beers when I come back. Okay, perfect. <laughs> save them. We'll sa- <laughs> I'll definitely save them, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> Have a good gig tonight, man. Will do. And another episode is done. And what a guy. Glenn is so funny, man. And his laugh is so infectious in this very warm guy. And he was telling me, if you're ever, you know, in Soho Square in London, in the middle, there's a, there's a wooden structure right in the middle. He was telling me that the comedian Marty Feldman used to live there. I think he said he was squatting with a few other people. Anyway, it was a nice little tip, but I don't think we recorded that. He was telling me when we were walking in. Um, so a big shout out to Glenn for making the time before his gig to come on. It really meant a lot. And yeah, thank you for downloading and subscribing. Now please go and tell your friends. They have 90 episodes of conversation to, uh, to get involved with. Yeah. Also, there's another thing. There was a few people asking why we weren't getting involved with the London Podcast Festival this year um we were going to it's again it's all about dates we just couldn't make the dates work for us um griff was busy i was busy and we were going to do something rather special and in fact we are going to do this at some point um myself and scroobius pip have been in talks about collaborating on something bringing the podcast together 
Um, so, yeah, watch this space. I think we're going to do it. I don't think we're going to leave it a year. I think we're going to maybe do a one-off event. Um, myself and Griff and Pip. Um, yeah, so but look, we'll keep you posted about that, which should be very exciting. Speaking of exciting, episode 91 next week. Um, no, I was going to tell you. I'm not going to tell you. Yeah, strap in. And if you're coming down to Kendall, come and say hello. Uh, it'd be really good to see you. Uh, I can't wait. See, I'm still excited about Nile Rogers. I can't believe it. And it'd be so great to see John because he's just one of the best. And I always felt that with our first episode with John, we didn't get enough time. So uh, we're going to rectify that on Friday. So look, we shall see you at the front in Kendall. Get there early. Last year, it was just mobbed. Right, I best go. Look, thank you so much. And uh, yeah, until next week or until I see you at Kendall Call him. I've been Craig Parkinson. He's been producer Griff. And this has been the Two Shot Podcast. You take care, look after yourself, all right? The Two Shot Podcast is presented by me, Craig Parkinson, recorded and produced by Thomas Griffin for Splicing Block. Our music, our brilliant music, is courtesy of Then Thickens. Cheers.